my goal today is to do a, a whole chapter, and I think it's a long chapter, but I think we can do it because we don't have to stop too much along the way. We want to mostly just kind of get the story in our heads. So uh, we left off, as you remember, um, Paul is, uh, well, we'll do a little quiz. Where, where, is, where was Paul when we left off at the end of 26? <laughs> He wasn't home. <laughs> yeah, he was in Caesarea. And uh, Festus was going to send him to Rome because he had appealed to Caesar. But God had already told Paul that he was going to bear witness to the Lord in Rome. So this is all part of God's plan. It's not just a story that's, uh, oh, that's interesting. This is interesting. It's, it's all unfolding a certain way. So um, today's chapter, the whole chapter, is going to be um, the better part of this journey on his way to Rome by ship. And it's very fascinating. People that have studied this um, say that Luke here in the book of Acts is actually one of the best resources, uh, uh, even out of all extra biblical resources for understanding um, shipping and seamanship back in those those days. He goes into a lot of details and it turns out everything he's saying, like the weather, um, the distance that the ship moves in a day, how they deal with the different things, it's, it's all exactly right. So this was not Luke sitting down and making up a story. This was, uh, this was all true to life and it's very, very historically accurate. So we pick up at chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Alright, when it was decided that we should sail, what does that tell you now? Luke is with them on this voyage. So that's one reason why there's so many details about this journey because Luke was there and he saw the, same, the whole thing. We haven't seen Luke's presence specifically noted since chapter 21. So it's a good guess that Luke has been with them this whole time, but he's definitely with them, with them now. So Festus chooses a centurion, this fellow named Julius, and Julius has a contingent of soldiers, and he's delivering Paul and apparently some other prisoners, we, we learn later, to uh, Rome. Verse 2, And embarking in a ship of Adramatium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. All right. Let's see if I can I can find it here. Uh, no, I don't I don't see it. So Adramitium I think is somewhere in this area right in here. So he's got a ship from there that he's picking up in um, in Caesarea. And also with him is this fellow Aristarchus. Now we've seen Aristarchus before too. He was in chapter 19. And it mentions that he's from Thessalonica. So it's possible that he's just riding the ship. And then he's going to change ship somewhere else and keep going up here to Thessalonica. But Paul mentions Aristarchus in two of the epistles that he wrote when he was in Rome. So later on, when he gets to Rome, he writes epistles, he mentions Aristarchus. So most likely, Aristarchus is also riding with Paul and Luke on this, this journey. So they, he has some companions, so that's a good thing. Uh, verse 3, the next day we put in at Sidon. So they're in, Thessal or in Caesarea here. The first stop is just going north here to the port of Sidon. It's only about 70 miles. You can see what they're doing. They're going, they're trying to go from port to port. They're trying to avoid being out here, right? They don't want to be in the open sea. And Julius, 
treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. So they put in at Sidon, and even though Paul is technically a prisoner, he has permission to leave the ship and go and visit the other Christians, go call him the Christian church there at Sidon and see his, his friends. Isn't that, isn't that a nice thing? Shows that um, Julius trusted Paul. Verse 4, putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. All right, so from Sidon, they're coming up around here, and you see this is the island of Cyprus. So they're coming around on the north side of Cyprus because the wind is against them this way. So the, the island shields them from, from some of that wind. So right away we're being introduced to what one of the big problems is going to be in this chapter. The weather. The weather. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. So they come around Cyprus and they come up here and here's there. this is the open sea now. And then they come to um, Myra. Now, um, Myra is a major grain port. So at this time, where is most of the wheat coming from that's feeding the, uh, the Roman Empire? It's coming from Egypt. So they grow the wheat here, and then they're shipping it up here. This is like one of the main ports, and from there, distributing it. And so uh, this is a, probably a fairly significant port. And a lot of the scholars believe that this fellow Julius... It was also, I can't remember the special name, did I write it down? There's a special name for um, Roman officials that have the job of managing this wheat transportation. So it's possible that this Julius was one of those guys. So that's one reason why he's making for that port. He, he, knows, the, he knows the grain trade. This is, this is his uh, field of expertise. Verse 6. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. So they're, they're transferring now from the ship they've been on to one of these grain ships. Here's Alexandria down in Egypt. So it's one of the big ships that they use for carrying the grain. And it's going now to, to Italy, so they change ships. Um, I, I don't know how big the ship is, but when we get to the end of the chapter, you'll see how many people are on board. So if you're picturing like a little sailboat or something, um, no, this, this is apparently a fairly good sized ship. Um, we sailed for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Cnidus, as, and as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. So they're out, they leave Myra, but now what's happening with those winds? Now they're in trouble again. So they're trying to get over here and to be protected from uh, the winds by the island of Crete, just like they did with, with Cyprus. <coughs> And they come down to the Salmon, which is the, the eastern end of, of Crete. Coasting along with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lysaia. So they're coming around this way. So just to get from the Salmon down here to Fair Havens, they're having a lot of trouble. Why are they having a lot of trouble? Wind. Yes, they're exposed to the weather on that, on, on that side. Um, verse 9, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them. Now, the fast, what is that? Oh, you've got a footnote there. Who can look that up? So it's the Day of Atonement. So this is the year 59 A.D., and the Day of Atonement in that year fell on October 5th. And so this corresponds to exactly what we know to be true. That it's, it's, it's in the fall now that ship travel in the Mediterranean becomes very, very dangerous because that's when the bad 
weather sets in. So this this is exactly fitting what we know to be uh, the, the case back in, the, in those days. So they've got bad weather, but they, how are they going to get from here up to, up to Rome? Now this is going to be a, a challenge. They're trying to beat the bad weather, but as you see, that's not what's going to happen. So Paul advises them, verse 10, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our, of our lives. Now, later on, Paul is, you'll see Paul is going to tell the centurion something because God told him. So this is not Paul saying, this is what God told me. This is just Paul saying, Hey, I, I travel a lot by ship. You know, I've made all these journeys, and I, I'm thinking this is a bad idea. <laughs> we're, we're not going to make it. Um, it's going to be dangerous. Verse 11. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. So Paul's saying, "Hey, let's not let's not try it." And the owner and the pilot are saying, "Oh, let, let's go for it." Why do you suppose they want to tr want to go for it? They want to get paid. Yes, they want to get paid. They don't want to sit and waste the whole whole winter now until next spring when they can start to travel again. Um, so the the centurion takes their advice. Uh, verse twelve, and because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So they're at this place called Fair Havens, but Fair Havens is not a good harbor. So it's basically like, you know, a, a, what would be a good harbor, right? Something like this, where you're coming in and you're protected all around. This is more like a 180 degree harbor like that. So you've got a little bit of protection, but really you're pretty exposed. It's not a good harbor. So apparently there's another harbor further west along the, on the island of Crete, and they're hoping to get there. Look at verse 13. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the close to the shore. So now all of a sudden they get a gentle south wind and their, their direction actually they want to stay along the coast so a south wind helps them and then head up toward Italy. This is this is like very promising. Hey, think this, this is looking good. By the way, you know I was in the Navy but that doesn't mean I, I know how to sail. Are, are there any sailors here that know how to sail? So you, you know you got to tack, right? You're going you, you, the wind blows one direction, so you've got to move your sail and you can't go straight. You're doing this to try to get to where you're going. Um, so so it's very, this is very challenging. A lot, of, a lot of work involved in all of this. Verse 14. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. So that we know to be true, that there are these Northeasters that come. So now instead of a soft wind coming from the south that could kind of take them up that way, now you've got a wind coming this way, right? And it's blowing over the island of Crete, coming around those mountains, and it's, it, the wind can speed up there. So they're actually facing a very difficult time <coughs> as, they're, as they're coming around that way. Verse 15, And when the ship was caught, and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. So they um, they can't go against it. It's, this is too strong. So you're just having to kind of go, go with it here. And running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. So apparently they ships in that time they would run these cables underneath it and secure them and that helped kind of hold the ship together in bad weather so they're they're basically securing for this bad weather and then fearing that they would run aground on the surface they lowered the gear and thus they were driven al along so um, you see the footnote for the gear <coughs> 
so we think that might be like the, the sea anchor. So why would you lower the anchor in the storm? To keep, to keep the ship more stable, to slow it down, not allow it to keep getting pushed forward. So they're, they're using all the sail, sailing techniques that people would have used back then to try to keep themselves alive in a difficult storm. In verse 18, since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the, the cargo. Um, so what are they doing now? What was the cargo? Wheat. Wheat. So they're throwing some of the wheat overboard to lighten, to lighten the ship. Verse 19, and on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. So now what are they doing? They're really having to lighten the, the load, get stuff off to try to survive this. Um, so this is not fun. Anybody ever been in a storm at sea? That I have done. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was on um, the aircraft carrier, and normally, you know, the Navy, we know when the storm's coming. You see, they can see it a long way off, so what do they do? They just steer, steer out of it. Um, but for whatever reason, we had to go through a, a fairly rough storm, and... Um, you're, you're taking the Dramamine and stuff like that because you feel sick, you know, going like this back and forth. And I, I still had to do the evening prayer, so I go up to the bridge, which is about, what would that be, maybe like 14 stories? Like coming to the top of a 14-story building. It's way up there. Um, and the navigator, he told me, he said, you know, you don't, you don't realize it, but when the ship sways, and we were, we were taking... Um, 17 degree rolls. Oh my. So 17 degrees doesn't sound like a lot. But if you're 14 stories up to move 17 degrees, he said that's 300 feet. You're going 300 feet back and forth like this. And uh, I, we canceled most of the, all the Bible studies and everything were canceled. <laughs> so I was like, everybody just stay in your stateroom and hold still. Um, but could you imagine what this would have been like on a, a wooden vessel 2,000 years ago yeah they're and if, if they're so scared that they're throwing their stuff overboard um, you know that it's a scary time verse 20 when neither Sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned so there's no break in the weather there's no blue sky anywhere. They're in the middle of this terrible storm, and now they're starting to get really scared. They're losing hope. Uh, verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. <laughs> and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. So Paul... Uh, Gives when when you've abandoned hope, what do you need the most? Hope. Hope. <laughs> Paul gives them some hope. What do you need second most? A plan. <laughs> Food. <laughs> so, something to eat. <laughs> in other words, we had that in the in the navy too. Just a, sometimes people, their jobs, they were in situations where there was so much stress and pressure on them, and it is hard to live with constant. I mean, if you made a mistake in your business, what would it cost you? If you made a mistake at, I don't know, if you made a mistake at work, Alex, you set, set the project behind a few weeks or something like that. But what if you make a mistake and a $36 million plane goes over the edge and somebody dies? You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure to deal with all the time. And guys would really get stressed out. And one of the things I learned as a chaplain you always ask them, are you, are you getting something to eat and are you trying to sleep? Even if you can't sleep, try to sleep. Because basic, it's like a, a, a 
Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? You can't you can't have your head squared away if you don't have basic things that you need squared away. So Paul is actually being a very good pastor here, giving them something to eat. And notice that the angel has reassured him that he is going to get to Rome. So before, when he, when he gave his advice and said, look, we shouldn't leave Crete, that was just his advice. This is now God's word telling them. Um, so they have the promise. So what do you see overarching this story? God's plan. God's, God's plan, exactly. There's, a, there's another very famous ancient Greek writing about a ship voyage. Does anybody, did anyone have to read the Odyssey when they were in school? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good, a good story. So this, the story of a ship facing all these dangers and traveling around the Mediterranean, that makes for a really good story, doesn't it? But behind it, we can't forget, this is God's plan. It's God's purposes to get Paul um, to Rome. So verse uh, 27. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea. Now, um, for us today, the Adriatic Sea is up here. Oh, what's the this is the Adriatic Sea. Um, but we have multiple ancient sources that call kind of the mid-Mediterranean, this area here. It's called the Adriatic Sea. So some people say, oh, you see, the Bible doesn't even know what they're calling their... No, that's what it was called back then. So well, they, didn't, they didn't make it out. Everyone's always trying to discredit the Bible. But how many days were they, were they traveling here? 14. 14 days. So experts at shipping have gone and figured out a ship that's, that's traveling in the storm like that um, and the way it would move... <coughs> How far would it go in 14 days thus far? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Wow. Um, it's, it's just right on the, the money. And about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So you, in, in, the, in the daylight, you could see the breakers if you're, if you're getting closer to land. You can actually see the rocks underwater, and you know something's, you're getting close. But in the dark, you can't see see it. So they're suspecting just out of their experience as, as, tra as sailors. Uh, verse 28, so they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little further on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. So what's happening? It's getting shallower. They are getting close to land. Um, verse 29, and fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. So when you let down the anchors from the, if, if the wind's blowing you this way, and you let down the anchors from the stern, what are you trying to do? You're just trying to slow yourself down so you, the wind doesn't throw you into those, those rocks. Um, verse 30. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. <laughs> so what's, what happens? They're so scared. The sailors let down the little, the little boat. And they say, oh, we're going to hook up the, the anchors up in the bow. But what are they really going to do? They're trying to get away from the ship and get to, get to shore. And Paul, who sees what's going on, lets the centurion know everybody has to stay with the, with the, the boat. So verse uh, 32, then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. So they, 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 they cut the rope so that small boat then now gets cast ad adrift. And so the, the sailors can't get ashore on it. But everybody needs to stay on the ship. That's Paul's Paul's advice. You see the important the, the significance of Paul, right? He's he's just a passenger. But when he says something, they're starting to take it to heart now. Julius knows. But whatever Paul says, we better we better listen to that. In verse 33. Um, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, 
Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you uh, strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of, of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to, uh, began to eat. Um, so they all stopped to eat. Paul realizes you've got to get your strength, but he's letting them know the Lord is going to take care of us. <clears throat> Nobody's going to be killed on this, on this ship. Uh, verse 36, then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. Um, now here, here's where we find out the size of this. We were all 276 persons in the ship. So that's a lot of people. How many yeah. people did we have in church this morning? Did anyone get a count? 661. So um, four and a half times more than what we had yeah. on this ship. So they're they're really there's a lot of people, and they're they're packed in there, aren't they? And by the way, Luke knows the exact number. How would he know the exact number? He was on the ship. Um, verse 38. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. So remember before, they already threw some of the wheat out. Now they're throwing the rest of the wheat out. What do you suppose the owner's doing? <laughs> he's starting to realize he's not going to get anything. But there, there's, a, there's a realization, you know, when you go from... We have to try to save the ship to... Um, we've got to save our lives. That's at that point the ship becomes a lot less important, right? Uh, verse thirty-nine. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land. So now the the sun comes up, and they're looking at the land that's in front of them. Um, they're being held down by these stern anchors, right? But they can see the the land ahead. And they notice the beach with a bay on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So the um, where they were in Crete has been changed some by um, an earthquake. So it may, they, we don't think it looks the same there today as it did back then. But there are people that today feel like they have identified the spot where Paul would have been. That, that, that there's a place there that fits this description that has, has been unchanged. Maybe, maybe not, who knows. Um, but if possible, what they're going to do is try to run the, the ship ashore. So if you can beach the, the ship, then you're only trying to go a, sh a short distance before you get ashore. And it's you're hopefully protected from being pounded and, and smashed up against the, the rocks. Verse 40, so they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. So they're just, they're just cutting the lines on the anchors, letting them go. And they're hoping now that they can steer this <coughs> ship right into the, right into the beach. Um, then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. So they're not putting up the mainsail but they put up the foresail because they don't want to go too fast, right? But they do want to be want, want to keep the ship moving in that direction. What if they don't put up any sail? Well, then the waves determine which way the ship hits. You, you can't control it. So you got to be you got to be moving faster than the waves so you can control where the ship's going to go. But you don't want to you, you don't want to go too too fast. Verse 41. But striking a reef they ran the vessel aground, so they they hit the they hit the rocks. Uh, the bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the by the the surf. So the bow of the ship is stuck in the rocks, and now the waves are coming in. And what are they doing to the ship? They're they're smashing the stern of the ship up. So it's it's all going to be destroyed. Everything's going to be ruined here. Verse 42, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. So all right, we're all going to have to swim ashore. Let's make sure that the prisoners don't escape. We'll kill the prisoners. <laughs> Verse 43, but the centurion 
wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. What, what impression do you get of the centurion here from the mentions of him up to this point? He was kind. I think he was a believer. Yeah, I don't know if he was a believer. We don't, I don't know if we have any indication of that. But he tries to be responsible. Like when Paul says, let's not leave Crete, he listened to the, the pilot of the ship, which probably in your situation, that's what you would have done too, right? Um, who's the expert here? The guy that's, that's used to drive the ship all the time. But more and more, he's listening to, to what Paul says. He's taking hope from what Paul has encouraged. He took, took food. He's, you're starting to see Paul as somebody that an emissary of the Roman Empire. He represents Caesar on the ship, right? He's, he's the highest in command. That he respects Paul and, and honors Paul and has been friendly to Paul and has trusted Paul. So there's a little bit of foreshadowing of what Paul should find when he gets to Rome, right? When Paul gets to Rome, should they put him in handcuffs and put him in a deep, deep dungeon and feed him only bread and water? There's no need to do that. Paul is being presented as someone who is wise and with whom the empire can, um, can work together. Now that's not always going to be the case. Later on, the empire is going to persecute the Christians terribly. But, but the picture that Luke is trying to give us is one where the, the empire has nothing to fear from, from Christianity, from Paul. Um, the empire should be able to to be a place where they're 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 at, at at peace with one another, so that the work of the gospel can can go on. Does that make sense? Can you sort of see that? All right. So verse forty three, the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. We'll find out next week, but where they are is the, the island of uh, Malta. That's where, they, where they've hit. Um, has anyone ever heard a sermon on this chapter before? I can only remember one, but it was a good enough one that I remember. <laughs> At the end of the story here, who was saved? All of them, they're all saved. Um, and how are they saved? Well, some can swim. So if you can swim, swim ashore. How are the rest saved? Hang on to something. And hope you, and, but they eventually get brought, carried by the waves, and, and they drift ashore. No one gets, no one gets hurt. And uh, the idea there, I think, is from the, the sermon I heard, which was very interesting, that when it's part of God's plan, when it's falling into God's purposes, this is not an accident, right? God is saving them because God is trying to get Paul to Rome. When something fits within God's purposes, um, people make it the best way they can. And not everybody is going to be as strong as the person next to them. Some are going to just barely get by, and some are going to come, you know, come ashore, swim in the 300 meter dash, you know, or something, but... Um, but they all they all make it, and I I learned that in the in the navy. You know that there are people who have great strength of character. There are people who are very disciplined. If you lay out a plan for them, um, how how to strengthen your resolve and achieve your purposes and grow in virtue and character, there's some that will follow it, and there's there's others that'll just barely make it. But um, you, you just got to help people get there the best way that they, that they can. Um, I, I, I wish I could reproduce that sermon. It was pretty good. <clears throat> pretty good. But the, the other and the last observation that I, I want to reemphasize then is why are we seeing all this stuff with the ship and everything that's happening to them? It's all part of God's purpose to get Paul to, to Rome. So that's what we're going to see next week. We're, we're doing pretty well. We were going really slow for a while, but now we look, we covered up.
long chapter. Um, we got through it all in a half hour. Any any questions or comments about anything in this chapter? You don't have all the deep, meaty theological stuff like you'd look for. But it's a reminder of this, this overarching purpose that God is getting him to Rome. So all the things that happen to him, all the, the 14 days at sea and all the trials and risks that they were going through, um, it's, it's because God is overseeing this. I, I just thought of the movie The Perfect Storm. Oh, if you've ever uh, seen that? It's to I feel like I did through. see it a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. scary stuff. Yeah. The storm is. Yeah, being at sea in a storm is scary. When you see like the waves come over the ship, Paul <laughs> sent me a picture of that. Yeah. 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 That's scary. All right, thank you, everybody. Hope to see you next week, and we'll learn what happens on the island of Malta.